Welcome to the Physician Associate Podcast. Hello and welcome to this episode of the Physician Associate Podcast. My name is James. Today I'm joined by Jonathan Dowden, who's an advanced critical care practitioner. Welcome to the show, Jonathan. Hi, thank you for the invite. It's lovely to be here. Really kind of you to give up your time to join us. And you have your own podcast as well, don't you, about ACCPs? Uh, I do. I mean, it's not specifically about ACCPs. It's about critical care in general. So yes, I've been running it, probably started it eight, nine years ago. So we're up to episode 155 or something now, I think. So um, still making it and still enjoying it. So it's called the Critical Care Practitioner Podcast, which you can find in any of the podcatchers. It's in iTunes, etc. Thanks, Jonathan. As physician associates, we often talk about how PAs interact with doctors and we forget Mm. that there are all sorts of other non-doctor clinical roles um, out there in the world and perhaps we don't always understand what a surgical care practitioner is or an advanced critical care practitioner is yeah there's all sorts of other people doing other things as well so so thanks for coming on and to talk about advanced critical care practitioners do you want to just explain a little bit about your your history and your career and your training yeah sure so I I'm a nurse by background. I started my training back in 1987, quickly moved into critical care back in 1996 and found the job that I loved. I was drifting around a little bit before that, not really sure. Loved nursing, but not really sure what specialty I was going to find myself in. Absolutely fell in love with it from day one. I'm very passionate about intensive care. Um, I love the team that we have in intensive care. Um, always love working with my nursing colleagues. So I worked my way through the ranks in critical care, ended up as what was then a G grade, um, you would call a band seven now. So critical care, charge nurse, if you like. Um, And then I was looking for another challenge and the opportunity came up to do the physician associate anaesthetics. Uh, We were a bit of a trial site in Birmingham. And I thought, yeah, that sounds interesting. So I'll go for that. So I spent two and a half years doing that, getting my postgraduate diploma, qualified at the end of it, passed the exams and then very quickly moved back into the critical care outreach team uh, because they were also calling out for um, senior posts for people to lead the team. Uh, I love the autonomy, the fact that we got out to the wards. Um, We were more responsible for identifying the deteriorating patient and either trying to stop them coming to ITU by initiating some care or some communication with the team or getting them to the critical care environment um, as quickly as possible if that was considered appropriate. The Heartlands Hospital decided that they needed advanced critical care practitioners and that was driven really by things like modernizing medical careers, which meant that the junior doctors would rotate through intensive care, but their rotations potentially could be quite short, as as short as four months, some of them, four to six months seems to be what they do now. And the problem with that was that um, there wasn't any consistency amongst the medical team, other than the consultants who stay there for many years, The registrars would stay for a little bit longer, but the juniors, the SHOs, and indeed the um, house officers as they were then, the FY1s and FY2s would not stay for very long. So you would spend the first, I would say, four to six weeks getting them up to speed with the way critical care worked, getting their skills, some of the uh, procedures we do, for example, arterial lines, central lines, all the sexy stuff that they would have to then be trained up to do that as well, which meant that the registrar was the only resource that could teach them those skills on a regular basis. The consultants would be doing other things, taking referrals, liaising with other teams, and the registrar would often be quite busy in places like A&E or the wards, um, taking referrals from those places. And as a consequence, the juniors sometimes were left to flounder uh, a little bit. There was also some gaps appearing in the rotors due to the change in the 
working the European Working Time Directive, for example, had quite an impact on intensive care in that the hours the juniors were allowed to work were significantly reduced, which meant that, of course, they weren't present as much as they were. Now, for me, the European T- Working Time Directive was a good thing. It meant that junior doctors, I'd spent my career watching junior doctors do some horrendous hours. Um, and for me, um, I thought it was an appropriate thing, but it did mean that we had gaps in the rotor. So it was seen that there was a space that needed filling. And fortunately, the consultant in charge of ITU at the time, who was very, um, he saw into the future quite well, um, saw that gap needed filling and asked us if we would like to take on the role of the advanced critical care practitioner. And basically the ACCP role, the idea behind it is that you work alongside the junior doctors either on their rotor or on a separate rotor. Places do it differently. We work on a separate rotor, but very much work alongside the junior doctors. And our role really is to um, do the things that they do. So we will, for example, my working day, if I give you an example of that, I'll go on the ward round in the morning, uh, which can take uh, an hour or two, sometimes longer. So we'll go around, review all the patients with the consultant, Um, occasionally the registrar, but the registrar is more often than not busy elsewhere. So there'll be me, the consultant and some junior doctors uh, all the way from, you know, CT1, 2, 3 to um, the FY1s, FY2s. And once we've reviewed the patients, we will then implement any changes that are required for their treatment for the day. So it could be that um, they need their prescriptions altering. It could be that they um, need lines putting in, for example. It could be that we need, um, and more commonly in COVID these days, we need to liaise with the relatives. Uh, We try and give them all a call every afternoon because they can't come in and visit at the moment. It could be that the patients need to go for various investigations. So things like CT scans, MRIs, um, and certainly in our hospital, we uh, this the ACCPs are responsible for transferring patients between departments. Um, and that's mainly because we are considered to be airway trained. And obviously, a lot of our patients are going to be intubated. And if they're not intubated, they're at risk of intubation. And the junior doctors, there was a time, you know, I remember when I worked in ITU as a nurse that you would get very junior doctors who had no airway skills at all. And they'd be sent tootling down the corridor with an intubated patient, which, you know, is is not necessarily the wisest course of action. And that's all changed now. So we will transfer the patients, we'll package them up. We know the routines. Often the junior doctors will come with us as part of their learning process, Um, but we know the routines. And we also do the inter-hospital transfers as well. So we would be responsible with uh, one of the nurses for packaging the patient, intubated or otherwise, taking them in the ambulance and transferring to whichever particular hospital they needed to go to. Uh, Yeah, as you can tell, our role is very varied. And I think one of the main benefits to the team, um, and this is certainly proven to be so, is that we provide a consistency to the team as a whole in that you will get the junior doctors rotating around and the focus of our time is helping them out letting them know how things work, answering questions, showing them procedures, teaching them procedures, helping them do the procedures, which they're all keen to do at the start of their training. Um, and then uh, we, we can start to then become a bit more hands off as they become more experienced and uh, they can fly a little bit freer. Uh, there was an argument at the start that we were taking away the training opportunities of some of the juniors and maybe certainly during our training, perhaps we were. But I think now we enhance their training because now they have somebody there to help them, whereas before the registrar would be busy elsewhere. That wasn't so much the case. So that's what I do. And that's what we do as advanced critical care practitioners. In terms of how you might become an advanced critical care practitioner, is it something like Physician Associates is open to anybody to apply to, regardless of your background? Or do you have to be a pre-existing registered healthcare professional to get into being an ACCP? 
at the moment, I believe that you do have to be a pre-existing healthcare professional. Now, whether that will change in the future, I don't know. I think probably one of the reasons for that is that the intensive care environment is, I mean, the name says it, doesn't it? It's a very intense environment and there is a huge learning curve that needs to be understood. There is a lot of experience that is invaluable if you're going to become an advanced critical care practitioner. There are so many things that you need to know that only come with experience. So, for example, the mechanical ventilation of the patient, the looking after the airway, the drugs involved, the interaction with the other members of the team, because obviously, a bit like yourselves, we interact with so many different specialties. Having said that, there are a growing number of critical care practitioners who are not from a nursing background, which I'm all for because I think that's just adds more value to the role that we take part in. So we have uh, physios, for example. We have uh, paramedics as well. Um, I know that there is now beginning to be a push for operating department practitioners to perhaps move into these roles as well. The main stumbling block for operating department practitioners is that the prescribing issue, which I think will get solved. That's often put forward as well. They can't prescribe, but I think that will change. It has for the paramedics. It has for the physiotherapist, so I can't see any reason why with the right amount of pressure that won't change as well. So ACCPs, are you a regulated profession? I understand that you probably have your registration with, if you're a nurse, the NNC, or if you're a paramedic, HCPC. Are you sort of registered as an ACCP on top of that? How does that work? Uh, yes, we are. Our registration is held with the Faculty of Intensive Care Medicine. So you have to go through a process of um, completing a portfolio according to the guidelines set out. So obviously, you've had to go through the training. You've had to do so many hours of supervised practice. You've had to have completed your. Uh, directly observe procedures so for your central lines and all those things they have to be observed as well Um, but yes we are registered through the faculty of intensive care medicine um, and once you are so registered i think i think you're now considered an associate member they changed the title recently but essentially that's who um registers yes we're on their register at the minute i don't think that's necessarily um a mandatory thing there are some sites that are running programs that haven't necessarily been accredited by the faculty of intensive care medicine but that's being addressed as well Uh, But yes, we are uh, ultimately all responsible to our uh, particular bodies. So I am um, obviously the uh, Nursing and Midwifery Council, so the NMC, and the other people are registered to their various bodies. But, you know, the, the general oversight is through the Faculty of Intensive Care Medicine. And in terms of prescribing rights, I think you sort of hinted at it earlier. Physician associates, we're unregistered at the moment, Um, although the GMC is taking us on. We also can't prescribe at the moment because we don't have prescribing authority. Mm. How does that work for ACCPs? Certainly from a nursing viewpoint, we have been um, able to undertake the non-medical prescribing courses that are run around the country for some years now. That, for me, is registered with the Nursing and Midwifery Council again. So I did mine back in, you know, I lose track, but I think it was 2012, 2013. Um, and that registration then sits on my um site with the NMC. You can also go through the supplementary prescriber method, which means that you have a range of drugs you can prescribe, which are fairly specific. But for me, I have overall prescribing rights. And as long as I know what I'm prescribing, just like any doctor should, uh, then I'm allowed to prescribe it. And the training. So for physician associates, it's a direct entry two-year, usually master's or postgraduate 
diploma, a university course that you pay tuition fees for, um, mm-hmm. sort of similar to what the medical students will do. I understand for an ACCP training pathway, it's more of a, is it like an apprenticeship model? You're sort of employed by the hospital and they pay you whilst you earn and learn? Yeah, absolutely. Um, the model that is used at the moment is is exactly that. So uh, the funding sources are from various places and uh, there are people who can speak better to that than I can. But Health Education England seem to be one of the places that are providing some of the pools of funding. Um, so what happens is that uh, posts are, well, job job plans are generated Funding is requested, uh, business plans are put in, which is all a very long winded process, as I'm sure you're aware from from your area of practice. But once that's done, then those posts are advertised. And one of the first things they're going to cover, and this is something I teach on at the University of Warwick as well, is clinical examination and diagnostics. So we cover things like, you know, respiratory, cardiac, neuro examination, amongst others. And then we cover some of the diagnostics, so interpretation of bloods, uh, ABGs, chest X-rays, bony X-rays, CTs, all those kinds of things. And they're assessed at the end of that. So with the examination, there is, uh, well, they were OSCEs, they're now called OSLERs. Um, but the OSCEs were essentially, as you would expect, walk into a room, do your examination, be assessed, make sure that you're good enough at it in a 10 minute period and walk out of the room and then go to the next room. The Osler now is a more encompassing one in that um, you're given 30 minutes to, you're presented with a patient and you do the examination and diagnostics and the history taking as a whole. During the training, they have to cover so many hours on the job, if you like, and they are in a supernumerary and supervisory supervised role. So they're not in the numbers, uh, which I think is absolutely crucially important. They're, it's considered to be learning time for them. Um, as they go through their training, they start to become less and less supervised, but ultimately they will always be working with another ACCP. It's something that is expanding across the country. Uh, I think the register now has something like 155 or 160. I'm plucking that figure out of the air a little bit, but I know it's around that. Whereas when we started back in 2011, I think there was probably more like 15 to 20 of us across the whole country. So um, the trusts are realizing that we are a valuable part of the workforce and we do have things to offer. So the training is quite tight, definitely. So by um, comparison, it feels very similar to the physician associate profession is expanding similarly in the last Mm. few years and trusts Mm -hmm. are realizing that they need other people uh, because there aren't enough doctors so they need other work members of the workforce yeah i think there's around two and a half to three thousand pas uh, at the moment wow i didn't realize there were that many yeah it's really exploded in sort of the last four or five years the numbers it's now about 35 university courses so it has Mm -hmm. grown quite considerably Hmm. um in terms of paying conditions for accps where do ACCP sit in that sort of agenda for change structure? There's a little bit of a debate about this and there's a bit of variety around the country. Um, we were very much of the thought that at advanced practice level as an ACCP, you should be paid as a band 8A. And I think that is becoming almost a national standard now. When it first started, there was there was some speculation that one should be trained at various grades, be it a band six or a band seven. There's good reasoning for both those arguments. Some trusts, I believe now, will train you at a band six. Once you've got your non-medical prescribing, you then move up to a band seven. And then once you become fully qualified, you are a band 8A. I do know there is a little bit of discrepancy amongst some trusts, though, because I do still hear of some qualified advanced critical care practitioners at band seven. Um, But there are some trusts now where their lead ACCPs who are leading a team of ACCPs are now being paid at a band 8B. And I think that's probably 
an important move because these teams are now not responsible just for providing the day-to-day -day care, the clinical side, but they're also getting involved in audit research and uh, in education. So those teams then need to be led to make sure that the team itself is moving in the right direction and not just acting as a group of individuals. Um, but the likelihood that you are going to be paid at band seven as a qualified ACCP, I think is going to start to be phased out because now the internal market will drive that out as people vote with their feet. Thanks, Jonathan. That really helps to clarify a little bit about some of the similarities and differences between physician associates and ACCPs. Mm -hmm. After you've done the ACCP training, what yeah. does that lead on to? I, can you, this is a clumsy question, but can you only... No, work? no, I know. I do know what you're getting at because this is one of the dilemmas that some people have in that often I hear people saying, well, once you're an ACCP at 8A, if you don't want to go into management, where do you go next? And this is a, an argument you could have of any position in any job, I would have thought, in the healthcare profession. You know, mm -hmm. it's the cry of physios, it's the cry of paramedics. You know, mainly paramedics get to a band six and then don't go anywhere else um, because there's not necessarily the career pathway for them to do so. As an ACCP, my argument there is not necessarily working your way up through the banding, but expanding what it is that you can offer the role. So um, there are now opportunities to ensure that we are an active part of the research process to drive forward the care of the critical care patient. There are opportunities to be involved in the audit process, which I think is very important. Education is crucial as well. We are still a relatively new workforce. We're still finding our feet a little bit. And I know that there are practitioners around the country. Uh, there's a couple in the Northeast that spring to mind instantly who are trying to drive forward the education process to ensure that we are not just embedded as another pair of hands, but are also becoming an essential part of the workforce in developing critical care as a whole. So I think, you know, saying that I'm an 8A and forever an 8A, it's what you make of that role as well. You can be an 8A who goes to work, sees the patients and comes home and does little else, which is fine if that's what you want to do. But you can also be an 8A who is driving processes forward and for me, one of the main things is inspiring other people to be better at what they do and also to be inspired to achieve greater heights. So I like to think that um, I'm always trying to encourage nurses in particular, because that's my profession. I'm trying to encourage nurses to stop having imposter syndrome, stop underselling themselves, realize their potential. So it's not what band you are, but it's what you do within that band that can help inspire others and move the profession as a whole. And I think probably amongst the PAs, there are going to be similar. Um, there are going to be similar people who um, will also realize that there's more opportunities out there to help develop the role and move other people forward within that role. Yeah, that's a really lovely philosophy to have for work <laughs> and what you can do to help others as well into the profession we ought to support each other as well because it's not easy sometimes being a disruptor or being a new part of the workforce can can have its challenges that are probably common across all of the medical associate professions and i know that there has been a certain amount of resistance amongst the medical profession and indeed for me the nursing profession um, as to the new roles that are being developed but i've always found that if you actually prove your worth to these people that probably 90 percent of the time they come out realizing that actually you are of value you do have something different to offer 
And if you can just prove to the naysayers that that is the case, they will generally come round to your side and indeed start singing your praises as a consequence. So if you do get some discouraging comments, my advice is to you, smile, continue to work hard, continue to add value. And I think you'll find that the majority of people will then start to come onto your side and indeed see you of value and somebody as a resource that they want to use as well. So don't let it become dispiriting because I've been there. I think perhaps one of the things that we're not very good as good at as um, an NHS workforce is coming together as a group of practitioners. So my colleagues, the surgical care practitioners, the advanced practitioners in A&E, um, we don't necessarily come together and not just share knowledge, but, you know, share stories, share experiences, uh, share ideas. I don't think we necessarily do that as well as we could. You know, we all go to the old conference or we used to, hopefully that will happen again where we can uh, network a little bit, but I think that's something that we can all improve on. Um, how we do that is through things like this, through the various podcasts. Um, I'm a great believer in the use of social media. Um, if you can use social media well, it provides an opportunity to network with people as well. So just to be aware of each other's presence and um, to acknowledge one another, and we've all got various things that we can offer to each other. And to be able to utilize that, I think, is a great advantage. So for me, that's something that um, could be improved. But other than that, no, nothing else to add. Thank you. Thanks so much for coming on the PA podcast today. That's if, my pleasure. If people want to find out a little bit more about advanced critical care practitioners, is there anywhere that you'd point them? Or are you happy for them to get in touch with you? They can get in touch with me, certainly, if at criticalcarepractitioner at btinternet.com. You can always get in touch with me there. If you uh, go to the uh, FICM website, so the Faculty of Intensive Care Medicine, uh, the Advanced Critical Care Practitioners have got a page on there. The various documents you can download if you just type in Advanced Critical Care Practitioners, you can see the requirements of the training and of the role um, Google will produce that for you. Um, and if you want to follow me at all, just Twitter is the place I'm at the most. So, and, uh, hopefully we can network and interact with each other. Perfect. Thank you. And I'll leave the links to your social media and the faculty of intensive care medicine pages about ACCPs in the show notes of this episode below. So people will be able to find them there. That would be fantastic. And thanks to you for listening as well. I hope that was a useful introduction to some of the other roles like advanced critical care practitioners for you. If you'd like to follow the PA podcast, we're on social media at PA Podcast UK. And I hope you'll join me again for the next episode. Thanks for listening to the Precision Associate Podcast.